see you coming down the ladder now. I'm uh, at the foot of the ladder. The limb foot beds are only uh, uh, depressed in the surface about uh, one or two inches. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Those were the words of Neil Armstrong as he daringly leaped out of the moon capsule in 1969 that left the world in awe and drove the National Air Museum to do some tweaking to its name before opening. With an initial contribution, Joseph Henry started the foundation of one of the most enormous museums to the state, including an abundant supply of artifacts to fuel the long exhibits the museum includes. Joseph Henry wasn't directly related to flight, but he created the foundation of one of the largest museums to the state. Joseph Henry was born on December 17, 1797. Henry's life would be hard growing up, his family being extremely poor and his parents being sick almost all the time, which came to the result of him living with his grandmother. Now, with all the troubles bothering him in his home life, it didn't stop him from being an, an exceptional student in the classroom and working a job after school. School was a breeze for him. He later enrolled himself into the Albany Academy on a free tuition. He graduated as a professor in mathematics and natural f philosophy. Later throughout Henry's life, he accomplished amazing things, mostly in the field of magnetism. Then probably his most known fact was that he was the first secretary of the Smithsonian. With scientists and inventors flocking to him to try to get their inventions and discoveries in the museum, he ran a tight schedule and didn't have time for any useless inventions. One day, Henry ran across a letter from a man named Professor Thaddeus Lohrer, a balloonist who was explaining how if you humans used a thinner-than-air gas in their balloons, they could double, triple, and even quadruple the size of the balloons and potentially transfer goods and people. The downside, however, would be that the goods and people would be gone with the wind. Henry, being fascinated with this idea, he took no time at starting experiments and tests, but he would not get very far because he would later die at the age of 80. The people at the Smithsonian did not forget his legacy, and on what would be his 106th birthday, he got an amazing present. How did the National Air and Space Museum come to be and change this world? On December 17, 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright completed the first manned flight on the sand dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, just 26 short years after the death of Joseph Henry. As the Wright Flyer was installed as a permanent exhibit in the Smithsonian in 1948, a visiting dignitary said that, it is a little as if we had before us an original eel. This was a consequence of a bill that President Harry Truman signed in 1946 establishing the National Air Museum, allowing the Smithsonian to organize and curate the already extensive collection of the lighter-than-air vehicles. The Air Museum's collection actually goes back to 1876 with a collection of 20 kites acquired from the Chinese Imperial Commission that has expanded over time to be the largest collection of aviation and space artifacts in the world. The addition of the word space to the name of the museum came about in 1966 when then President Lyndon Johnson changed the name of the museum to National Air and Space Museum. The inclusion of space exploration to the museum was done before we had landed on the moon, but served to underscore the commitment of the United States to the exploration of space.
the Smithsonian became the future home of either the success or failure of the American space program. And on July 20, 1969, astronaut Neil Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface and cemented his place in the halls of the National Air and Space Museum. The outstanding success of American aviation and space technology dictated the relocation of the museum to a new location on the National Mall between 4th and 7th Streets in 1976 to display to all visitors to the outstanding contributions of a nation of inventors and explorers. Some of the astonishing artifacts and exhibits that make the museum so unique. The museum today contains a small fraction of the 60,000 items it has acquired over the years. Of the items displayed, one after the other tells a story of mankind's fascination and obsession with flight. From Robert Goddard's early rocket motors to the giant Saturn F-1, from Charles Lindenberg's Spirit of St. Louis to Chuck Yeager's Bell X-1, from the doomed Hindenburg to the Apollo 11 command capsule, visitors are reminded of the breathtaking advances that have taken place in less than two lifetimes. These exhibits are not just to serve as reminders to those who are taking attendance of the advances we have made, but to inspire the future generations to take bold chances and explore the heavens. Somewhat ironically, many of our future flight machines will never return to Earth or a waiting museum. Today, robotic crafts are traveling across the surface of Mars, surveying a distant comet or one intrepid craft. Voyager 1, launched one year after the opening of the museum, has gone interstellar. No flying machine will ever fly from New York to Paris. No known motor can run at a requisite speed for four days without stopping. That was a quote from Orville Wright, just showing you that they took the step to make it happen. We took the leap that made it happen.